Dear guests, colleagues, partners and friends, I want to welcome everyone to the public release of the call for actionable steps in response to the rising threat of antimicrobial resistance, which has been developed by members of the AMR multi-stakeholder partnership platform in anticipation of the United Nations General Assembly high-level meeting on AMR in 2024. My name is Malin Grappe. I'm uh, the Swedish government's ambassador on antimicrobial resistance, and I'm delighted to be your host today. Um, and I think as all of you, or at least most of you know, 2024 really marks a historic year for the global agenda on antimicrobial resistance. We have a number of dedicated events, discussions, high-level meetings, including, of course, the UNGA high-level meeting in September. And we have the fourth ministerial conference on the EMR in November this very same year. So this really presents an opportunity for all of us to reinvigorate our shared commitments to tackle EMR. Uh, an invisible, or at least not so visible, but yet profoundly impactful threats. Furthermore, this year could mark the beginning of a decade of implementation with the adoption of the second politi political declaration by the UN member states in September 2024. And today we have gathered for a unique initiative, and this is the release of a call for actionable steps in response to the rising threat of AMR, which has been developed through an inclusive and participatory co-creation process, which was led by members of the AMR multi-stakeholder partnership platform under its action group on UNGA. And for those of you who may not be aware, the AMR multi-stakeholder partnership platform is a global collaborative and inclusive forum which was established by the quadripartite Apartheid organizations, FAO, UNEP, WHO, and VOA. As one of the global governance structures on AMR, which were recommended by the Interagency Coordination Group to the UN Secretary General in 2019. And in today's meeting, we will hear from the members of the platform about the vision that was developed and jointly shaped by its members in these recommendations aiming to outline concrete and actionable steps to address AMR using the One Health approach to be considered by UN member states in their negotiations of the second political declaration. And we have a distinguished list of guests and members who will guide us through the recommendations and also brief us about the UNGA HLM high-level meeting process particularly its upcoming multi-stakeholder hearings on May the 15th in New York. And I have the exciting task of uh, presenting 14 speakers in the next hour. So I also want to ask all speakers to show each other the respect and not extend your interventions beyond the time slot that was given to you. Uh, before we proceed, I would also like to remind everyone of a couple of housekeeping rules. Please keep your microphones muted throughout the session. This session will also be recorded and the recording will be shared via the platform's communication channels. So without further ado, I would like to invite our panelists for the opening session for the welcome remarks. So dear Mikhail, over to you. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here today and present the AMR Multi-Stakeholder Partnership Platform's call for actionable steps in response to the rising threat of antimicrobial resistance. This call is a testament to the collective effort and commitment of all stakeholders, reflecting our shared belief in the urgency and importance of addressing AMR. Um, my name is Michiel Peters. I represent the Secretariat of the AMR Industry Alliance on behalf of our members, who are all life sciences companies joined in their belief that the challenges of AMR must be tackled together. 
I also have the privilege of representing the private sector on the platform steering committee as its vice chair and have led the platforms action group on Yunga together with IFPMA and ISOA. Uh, and before I speak briefly to the content of our call for actionable steps, I would like to take a moment to thank the over 60 representatives from the platforms clusters, including governments, academia, civil society, financial and philanthropic institutions and the private sector, who have taken the time over the last few months to participate in this process. Their invaluable contributions have been instrumental in shaping this call to action. I also want to thank the almost 100 organizations that have explicitly supported the call for actionable steps, um, and we're very happy with their support. With the high-level meeting in September, we have a unique opportunity to make significant strides in combating AMR. And if we do not curb AMR, current antimicrobials will become ineffective against infections. Put more drastically, we could be turning back the clock on modern medicine as we know it. And it's in this regard that we advocate for UN member states to include the outcome of our discussions in the negotiations on the 2024 declaration. I will not go over each of the individual recommendations as our panelists will do that later in the program. However, I want to highlight some of them from our perspective, starting with ensuring universal, equitable, affordable, and sustainable access, including in rural areas, to quality essential medicines, vaccines, and diagnostics for humans and animals. From our perspective, this will require governments to work together with other stakeholders to effectively address barriers that limit access when it comes to, for example, investing in diagnostics infrastructure, regulatory issues, forecasting and surveillance, and procurement. I'd also like to touch on the fact that we need to encourage high-income countries and other stakeholders to commit to taking an end-to-end -end approach to sustainable antimicrobial research and development. More is needed in the form of market-based incentives to drive antimicrobial R&D and encourage researchers and medical specialists to stay dedicated to this critical area of medicine. Lastly, preventing and addressing the drivers, sources, and challenges of AMR in the environment is an important part of what we should be working on. And one crucial step here would be for countries to adopt the third-party certification of the antibiotic manufacturing standard as part of their tendering and reimbursement policies. We are honored that so many of you have decided to join the launch of these recommendations today. We look forward to working together to reach out to UN missions and their representatives and underline the importance of actionable steps in the fight against AMR. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mikhail. And that was a really insightful welcome. Uh, today, we're also privileged to have members of the quadripartite organizations with us. And I would like to extend a warm welcome to Jean-Philippe Dopp, the Deputy General, uh, Director General of the World Organization for Animal Health, WOA, for his welcome remarks. So, dear Jean-Philippe, the floor is yours. Thank you, and thank you first for the invitation to speak on behalf of WOA and the quadripartite. Dear participants, uh, today marks a, a pivotal moment as the action group on UNGA high-level meeting on IMR of the IMR multi-stakeholder partnership platform unveils the call for actionable steps in response to the growing threat of antimicrobial resistance. This release is not just a document, it's a blueprint for action. I extend heartfelt appreciation to the members of the IMR partnership platform from all five clusters and 13 action groups for their unwavering commitment, expertise, and dedication to crafting a vision that will be presented to UN member states. Together with uh, other quadripartite organizations, FAO, UNEP, and WHO, we established this platform exactly for this reason, to enable diverse voices converge, expertise collide, and where solutions in multiple sectors and at all levels are not just discussed, but actively sought and co-created. We, 
as a quadripartite stand united in our belief that only through a one health approach, working across sectors, disciplines, and geographies, can we effectively address IMA. Our quadripartite strategic framework for collaboration on IMA embodies this conviction, guiding our collective efforts towards a healthier future for humanity, animals, agri-food, and ecosystems alike. Our priority is to strengthen the global governance on IMA by leveraging our sector-specific and multispectral expertise, mandates, and comparative advantages using the One Health approach. We, in particular, the World Organization for Animal Health, we emphasize that the cross-sectoral collaborative efforts must integrate the expertise of animal health professionals in tackling IMR. In this regard, we stress that responsible use of antimicrobials in animals is key in contributing to the global effort to curb IMR. We also think that access to high quality vaccines with defined animal vaccination strategies, complemented with effective implementation of biosecurity measures, good animal husbandry practices, and the development of alternatives to antimicrobials will be instrumental. No doubt that uh, the quadripartite forthcoming policy brief will provide insights on the key priorities for UN member states to consider, and this is with very much welcome. In this shared endeavor to turn the tide on IMR, every sector has a role to play and attention must be commensurate with both needs and capacities. As we look beyond the UN General Assembly, implementation of commitments becomes paramount. Now is the time for action. The IMR partnership platform through its action-driven nature and spirit encapsulated in its action group proposed and driven by members following a bottom-up approach, stands ready to support countries and all other stakeholders with concrete solutions, leveraging the vast network of expertise and resources. Let us not merely talk, but act. Today's call launches a decade for action. Together, we will act. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jean-Philippe, for your valuable insights in, into the uh, global efforts of the Quadripartite organizations. So next, I'd like to invite Thanavat Tianxin, who is the FAO Director for Animal Health and Livestock Production, and also the Chief Veterinary Officer of FAO, to deliver his opening remarks. And thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Tianxin. The floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. Dear Excellencies, distinguished guests, partners, friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is my deep honor to be here with you today on behalf of the Quadripartite Organization, FAO, UNAP, WHO and VOAR colleagues. The public release events of the call for actionable steps in response to the rising threat of antimicrobial resistant AMR. It is a testament to our collective resolve in crafting a comprehensive vision on AMR using the One Health approach. At FAO, we firmly believe in the power of collaborative effort, partnerships, and joint endeavors to spur actions proposed innovative solutions, seek compromise, foster co uh, constructive dialogues, and forge consensus on pressing issues. We know that working together is a challenge. Bring people together and work together. We need to discuss, we need to find solutions, we need a flexibilities and compromise. And that's why AMR, is a global threat that bring us together and we need to act now. The AMR is undeniably one such critical issues transcending borders, sectors and discipline. Only by joining forces can we effectively confront it for the well-being of our people, 
our animals, our plants, our environment, and our planet. Just last week, FAO launched the 10 years initiative aiming at reducing the need on antimicrobials on farms for sustainable agri-food system transformations called Renofarm Initiative in China. The events bring the participations from the participants from over 100 individual worldwide from more than 40 countries. All of them come to chair determinations to collaborate with among themselves. We have representative from farmers, producers, private sectors, governments, research institution, which actually I think many of colleagues here today who join us also participated in that meeting in China. Because we discussed and we would like to bring solution to reduce the need for antimicrobials. This one is our aim. And we have the remarkable enthusiasm and commitment to make sure that we can do better and we can move forward together. The success of our joint endeavor hinges upon our abilities to harness these collective intelligence and dedications. My dear friends, the AMR multi-stakeholder partnership platform established by the quadripartite organizations in 2022. But today, the AMR multi-stakeholder partnership is go beyond quadripartite organization because all of you who join us make it more wider, make it more approachable by everyone. Which actually the AMR multi-stakeholder partnership platform have evolved into formidable network comprising more than 200 organizations, networks, federations from diverse sectors, disciplines, regions, who are committed to collaborative action with your strong commitment, with your strong collaborations, we can make change. And the change will come from our strong commitment through AMR multi-stakeholders partnership platform. With the release of this call to action today, we demonstrate to the world that our diversities and multiplexities of perspective can coalesce into a robust and holistic visions and propelling us forward in our joint efforts to turn the tide on AMR. The recommendation encapsulated in this call to actions reflect the majorities and the diversities of real point of the platform members. We firmly believe that the visions outlined in these key recommendations will greatly support our member states in their deliberations on the second declarations of AMR at the UNCA high-level meetings on AMR's schedule for September 2024 in New York. And actually next week, the global leader meeting, global group leader, uh, leader group meeting will be held in Sweden and we will continue to discuss. And by the end of the year, uh, the high level ministerial conference on AMR will be hosted by the government of Saudi Arabia. And that's why we need to take all the collective action to present the result to highlight the impact that we make. And that's why I take this opportunity to extend my heartfelt grat uh, congratulations to all members of the platform for their unwavering dedications and effort 
in addressing AMR, this global health and the development threats which impact humans, animal, plants, food securities, and environment. Especially this year at FAO, we will host the Global Conference on Animal Health Innovations, Reference Centers, and Vaccine, together with other partners on 23rd to 25th of September. Because we want to bring the action that we are implementing at the ground level, at the country level, to be highlighted, to be to showcase and highlight at the global level. And one of the issues is about AMR. And I would like to express my sincere gratitude to all colleagues and to my friends and colleagues in the corporate Cordepartite for their strong support of AMR partnership platform and also the members of these partnerships and all colleagues who are supporting us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Tianxin. And next, I'd like to invite from the WHO, Jean-Pierre Niemarsi, who is uh, Acting Director on Global Coordination and the Partnership Department of the WHO, and also the Codepartite Secretariat on AMR. And JP, if I may ask you to keep your intervention short, so we have time for everyone to speak in this seminar. Thank you, the floor is yours, JP. Thank you, Marin, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests and uh, colleagues. I I'm glad to again speak as well along my uh, fellow quadrupartite organization members and also add my voice and say that uh, we know now addressing them requires a one health multi sectoral response. And the quadrupartite organization, as has been discussed by uh, my predecessors, have established the quadrupartite joint secretariat on AMR with the view to coordinate the one health response to AMR across human health, animal health, agri-food system and environment. Again, it has been also uh, said that the quadrupartite joint secretariat implements a joint strategic framework for collaboration in AMR. Some of the other functions that the quadrupartite joint secretariat does include to support such governance structures on AMR, which includes the Global Leaders Group, which is chaired by High Excellence Prime Minister of Barbados, Myanmar Motri, and also the AMR Multisecoder Partnership Platform, which we are celebrating today the launch of the key recommendations for the Member States' consideration for the high-level meeting on AMR. We also host other key uh, structures, including the AMR Multipartner Trust Fund, that supports the implementation of the joint work uh, to address AMR across LMIC's countries. However, this has been a functional arrangement, and I'm glad uh, among the recommendations from the, the partnership platform includes to recommend to the member states to affirm the role of the quadrupartite organization and mandate the quadrupartite joint secretariat as a key mechanism for coordination of the multisectoral action against AMR. So we believe with that, we'll be able to sustain such as important governing structures and uh, we'll keep working together and provide such platforms for all the stakeholders to contribute to the response. Now, besides uh, WHO hosting the Quadrupartite Joint Secretariat and contributing to the One Health response, towards the end of this month, the 77 World Health Assembly we consider the WHO strategic and operational priorities to address drug resistance bacterial infections for a people-centered AMR response. This plan highlights four main strategic access, including prevention of infections, universal access to quality diagnosis and appropriate treatment, strategic intelligence and innovation, effective governance and financing of the human health sector response to AMR, among the others. Now, as I conclude, we all recognize that the 2016 political declaration was an important milestone where world leaders signal an unprecedented level of attention to AMR and the countries reaffirmed their commitments to develop AMR national action plans. However, 
we all know that the progress has not been matching the desired state. The 2024 Anga High Level Meeting on AMR offers a unique opportunity to further boost the agenda and action to match the agents of the AMR burden, which has become clearer in the recent years. The cooperative organization are on hand to support this process, including by jointly creating key messages to inform Anga HLM, supporting discussions such as this, supporting the important work by our co-facilitators that we thank so much for being there and uh, steering this effort, and briefing our respective member states in different capitals. Again, I hope that the recommendation being released today, along with the GLG recommendations that have been released on the 4th of April, and the key messages from the quadrupartite organization will help inform a productive and effective year of progress on antimicrobial resistance. Thank you so much. Thank you, JP. Uh, and talking about the high level meeting, uh, we are really honored to have uh, the co facilitators of the uh, high level meeting with us today. The permanent representatives of Barbados and Malta uh, are joining the meeting today. So, um, first, I'd like to introduce His Excellency Mr. Francois Jackman. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, and I'd like to hear from you. Could you please share some insights into the UNGA high-level meeting process and the upcoming multi-stakeholder hearings that we already heard about for next week, and the role that the stakeholders could have in this meeting? So please, Francois, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Malin, and good morning uh, to all colleagues, excellencies, and friends, it's really a, a pleasure to, to be with you this morning. And I must say, when I started off this role as co-facilitator, it wasn't obvious to me that there would be such a warm and active community uh, around this subject. And it's really been one of the highlights, certainly for me, to have found uh, so many willing uh, and energetic and constructive interlocutors. So, so thanks again for the invitation. Um, I'll say I'll try and answer your question a little bit, but I think uh, Ambassador Fraser will also, in her remarks, talk a bit about the process. So I really wanted to try and say two main things about uh, the process and where these excellent recommendations that uh, this group has put together fit in. Um, so first of all, these recommendations are incredibly valuable. Uh, because they're contributing to the kind of broader debate. They're helping member states figure out what is the most important things, what are the most important things that they need to focus on in these negotiations. And as you know, member states, uh, negotiators, member states are very busy. They're doing all sorts of other things at the same time as they are negotiating uh, in this process. And so having clear recommendations like these both the recommendations themselves and the kind of the detailed explanations is an incredibly valuable tool. And these recommendations have two special, in my view, two special qualities. First of all, uh, they come from a group like yours, which is broad, diverse, uh, varied, but extremely authoritative, data-driven and science-focused. And as you know, sometimes in the UN, these, uh, these qualities can be lost in the political and diplomatic cut and thrust. So having recommendations that are so well-founded in the science, in the data, in the authoritative institutions is really something that can help the member states, but it can also help the co-facilitators to say, well, here is a body of recommendations and of work that all member states need to look at because it comes from this place of expertise uh, and knowledge. And then the second point is, and it's obviously connected to, to the first point, and it's connected to points made by colleagues before already, is that these recommendations are the result of a consensus. You have already all agreed on this. And I don't need to emphasize in this audience just how valuable and important consensus is. And as the co-facilitators, we are looking to develop a political declaration that has both 
the, the data-driven, uh, fact-based substance and ambition, but also that produces the consensus amongst all member states that we need if this is really going to be a tool uh, to address the urgent uh, AMR crisis. And these recommendations have both of these qualities. There's the quality, the content, the substance, the, the data-driven side of it on the one hand, and you have produced uh, a document around which all of you, all of these important authoritative institutions agree. So this is a, a really strong signal, I think, to member states that it's possible to be ambitious and consensual. And as the co-facilitator, that is really what we, I think, have been entrusted to try and help member states achieve the consensus and the ambition together. And the recommendations that you're launching today really have a very valuable role to play in that regard. Um, so really in closing, I just wanted to, to say that we, we rely on you all as a group and on the institutions that you represent individually to keep, to keep at it, as it were, to keep pressing on the process, pressing on the member states to be as ambitious uh, as we can be while keeping that spirit of consensus alive. So really, thank you very much. We, we rely on your continued support and I look forward to this morning's discussions. Thank you, Molly. Thank you so much, Francois. And I think I will follow up directly because we had a really good uh, question in the, in the Q&A here. Uh, now we, we see that these recommendations are well received by you as co-facilitators, but there's also a question here on advice on how to reach member states with these same um, uh, recommendations and, and how to maybe reach the kind of outer circle. There is, there is a smaller circle, there's a group of friends of countries that are already quite engaged in AMR, but, but how do we reach broader than this? If you could share your thoughts on this, thank you. Well, I would say events like these are obviously uh, one way of doing it. Uh, I have had the opportunity to meet with a number of you one-on-one uh, -on -one and in, in other events. And I, I would encourage you over the next few months to continue that outreach to member states, key member states, also groups of member states who may be uh, less engaged in this issue. And then lastly, I think this is really important for the negotiations themselves, for the kind of the process part of it. I think it's important where you can, and your organizations all have vast networks and, and outreach programs, talk to our ministries and authorities in capitals, because negotiators depend on negotiating briefs sent to them from their ministries at capital. So if the ministries are informed, involved, aware, they will be able to provide their, their negotiators with a better, broader set of negotiating briefs, which will enable us as co-facilitators to drive the process towards greater ambition. So I think continuing this kind of outreach, but also where, where it's possible, talking to your correspondents, your counterparts in our capitals will be really an important way of socializing, socializing uh, these uh, recommendations. Thank you so much. And I think you're sharing your insights and, and this information is really incredibly valuable to, to the members of the platform. So thank you so much for this, Francois. And now I'd like to invite you all to watch a video message from Her Excellency Vanessa Fraser, who is the permanent representative of the Republic of Malta to the United Nations.
colleagues in the newsroom, we provide practical information on the modalities. I also invite you to listen to the hearings via web streaming. As you know, this event will be a one-day discussion divided into three panels targeting adequate, predictable and sustainable financing and investments in the AMR response. Apologies, colleagues, I think there was no sound, so we can try to re-listen it again. Dear Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, Partners, Friends and Colleagues, the release of the call for actionable steps in response to the rising threat of antimicrobial resistance, AMR, are a testament to the collective multi-stakeholder efforts of the AMR multi-stakeholder partnership platform. This marks a critical juncture for us all and drives our collective resolve to confront AMR through the One Health approach. My heartfelt congratulations to all members of the platform for their unwavering commitment and tireless efforts in addressing this global health and development threat that affects humans, our animals and plants, our food and our environment. This call for action, a convergence of expertise, knowledge and skills, shows that facing AMR requires unity across the various sectors as we look ahead to the UN General Assembly High Level Meeting on AMR on 26 September 2024, let us seize this opportunity to amplify our voices and accelerate progress. Your participation in the upcoming multi-stakeholder hearing on 15th May is paramount. The discussions in New York will set the stage for decisive action on AMR and is the first important milestone, enabling us to hear perspectives and opinions of various actors. I hope that many of you are registered and will be able to attend and share your insights. I also encourage you to submit your written and video contributions. Our colleagues in the platform will provide practical information on the modalities. I also invite you to listen to the hearings via web streaming. As you know, this event will be a one-day discussion divided into three panels targeting adequate, predictable and sustainable financing and investments in the AMR response to support country-level implementation. Secondly, addressing antimicrobial access, research and development and innovation. And finally, effective governance, leadership and coordination of the AMR response at the national, regional and global levels. A summary of discussions will be produced and will contribute to the drafting of the zero draft declaration for the UN member states, discussions and negotiations. The UN member states will have a challenging task to work on this draft over the summer to come up for the high level for the UN high level meeting on AMR in September with a declaration that is at our level of common expectations, concrete, action oriented, and taking us forward in our joint efforts to address AMR. Ladies and gentlemen, as we advance towards these pivotal meetings, we must remember our shared duty to safeguard the health of present and future generations, our animals and our planet. Together with Ambassador Jackman, I am committed to ensuring the success of this pivotal UNGA process. In closing, I extend my deepest gratitude to all participants for their dedication and passion and to the quadripartite for their unwavering support to the ANGA process. Thank you all. So sorry for the uh, technical challenges there, uh, but happy that we could all hear this video message. Um, and Again, it's, I think it's really useful for the members here to know that that's the voices and the recommendations and the opinions of all stakeholders are really 
considered in the development here. Uh, so, dear all, now it's really time to, to go into these recommendations, hear a bit more about uh, the vision of the members when these were crafted and get a bit deeper understanding of the different uh, recommendations. So I'm very pleased to invite uh, Sujit Chandi, who is the Executive Director of the International Center for Antimicrobial Solutions, ICOS to share his valuable insights. And he really has the challenging task of, of talking about as much as four of these recommendations, number one, two, four, and five. So Sujit, um, considering these recommendations, um, what key strategies should be prioritized to advance the implementation of national action plans through the One Health approach? And why uh, do you see that governance of the AMR response is so crucial? Please, Sujit, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, my thanks to all the organizers and uh, those involved with the multi-stakeholder partnership platform, especially you, the stakeholders are listening in. I've gone through the recommendations and I think they're comprehensive and my appreciation for putting this together. I know it's not easy to put such a important document together. But we need to make the recommendations beyond just words. We need to make the text live. I truly think that we need to make it meaningful and purposeful to make it actionable. I think this is the first step towards that. But really speaking, to answer your question, in order to do that and ensure that these recommendations facilitate the forward movement of the national action plans and the global action plan, I think we need to First of all, listen to the M LMIC voices. And when I say listen, it's not just listen actually, but to understand these voices. And I un underline the word understand. But how do we actually do this? Especially keeping recommendations one, two, four, and five in mind, which I've been asked to speak up. And I think there are different stakeholders in different sectors, and they all have their needs, their fears, and expectations. And this varies from country to country. There are local challenges and there are different burdens in these sectors. So therefore, it's very important to be able to generate evidence, evidence synthesis, but from a contextual and country-owned solutions point of view, if you really need to move forward with these maps. The One Health lens is equally important, and we keep saying this, the intersectoral coordination and funding mechanisms but let's again remind ourselves that the challenges are different, and so are the risks. So I think the risk-benefit analysis in these sectors is very important. And we need to make sure that in all these recommendations, we do not leave any sector behind if you really believe in true One Health. The top-down and bottom-up approach, I think, is also going to be important, where we try to build bridge the science to the policy but also to the implementation. In order to do that, actually the government buy-in is very important because the political will needs prioritization of these recommendations, but also political messaging. But we also need to understand that it's not just government buy-in, but stakeholder involvement. All of you listening into this are part of the stakeholder, but let's not forget the community, community engagement. Lastly, Impact and sustainability, really speaking, we do a lot of projects in this area, but have we truly understood the economic case? Have we built it into our projects? Equally, the behavioral change strategies, they need to be evidence-based, but with the context keeping in mind affordability, accessibility, and the long-term mind of holistic stewardship. Of course, there are lots of things we can do as interventions, but let's not forget prevention, vaccination, infrastructure, health and farm system strengthening, WASH, IPC. Easy to say, but difficult in the context of the geopolitical world that we live in. But I think we need to remind our countries. In conclusion, I think this is a call for actionable steps. But if we need an effective and purposeful roadmap for actual action, let me conclude by saying we need the following. The first, I think, is global governance. The independent panel 
is going to be extremely important if we need to generate the evidence to action. But we also need to mind, remind ourselves that politicians and governments and countries have competing priorities and agendas. So where is that synergy between the various global agendas, the pandemic treaty, for example, or climate change? And we need to work much more on synergizing them. We need accountability and monitoring mechanisms. And we need to match and couple these targets and indicators with research and resources for effective implementation. If you really want to move action, we need the investments, of course, but let's not forget the opportunity costs and evidence generation. And finally, communications and dissemination. Let's try to make these recommendations clear and understandable for policymakers, for stakeholders, for community with proper dissemination. I think if we can do some of these things, prioritize these, we would have forward movement on recommendations one, two, four, and five. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sajid. And now I will turn to uh, Mr. Martin van Gerven, who is research coordinator from the Access to Medicines Foundation. And he will talk about the recommendations eight and nine concerning the importance of access research and innovation. And Martin, uh, how can we ensure equitable access to existing and new antimicrobials, especially in developing countries? And uh, further, what measures can be implemented to address the market failures and expedite research and development for antimicrobials, also for diagnostics, vaccines, and possibly other tools? Please, the floor is yours, Martin. Thank you, Malin. And indeed, it is absolutely crucial that every patient has access to the right anti antimicrobials. Um, and this is independent of where they live in the world. Because currently, the lack of access to antimicrobials uh, does not only lead to a lot of people dying from curable diseases, uh, it is actually also a major driver of AMR. Um, so what are a few examples that UN member states can do to ensure access to essential medicines, uh, vaccines, diagnostics, um, not only for humans, um, but also for animals? And with the group, we came together and we saw that appropriate access should start with evidence-based guidance. We need to build a clinical evidence base to develop clear guidelines for when and how antimicrobials should be used. And in addition, we need to establish global and national list of essential medicines, diagnostics and vaccines for humans as well as for animals, thereby also considering the antimicrobials that are currently urgently needed in low and middle income countries. And finally, at the moment, uh, pharmaceutical companies are not widely registering their antimicrobials in these low and middle income countries. And this is partly due to the lengthy registration procedures. Therefore, it will be critical to promote harmonized registration and support the capacity building of regulatory systems. And these access interventions are needed for new and existing antimicrobials. However, like you said, how can we make sure that there will be newly developed products to begin with? Um, and like the access issue, um, there is no doubt that there will be a big role for the pharmaceutical sector, but to support the development of new antimicrobials, we specifically call on high income countries to apply an end to end approach to R&D. And the key here will be to increase public investment in push and pull incentives. And these incentives must target priority pathogens and should also consider disproportionately affected populations like women and children. Because um, to give an example, uh, one in every five people that are dying from resistant infections are actually children under the age of five. And it also takes around 10 years before approved antimicrobials are tailored for children. Finally, promoting access and stewardship as part of r &E funding will be critical to ensure appropriate access globally. So by considering access and R&D needs in the run-up to ANGA, I think we have a major opportunity to take action in curbing AMR. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martin, for this insightful overview of access research and the innovation aspects of AMR. 
so next, I'd like to invite Arjan van Höflingen, who is Chief Strategic Policy and Public Affairs at the World Federation for Animals. And uh, here we also have on these recommendations six and seven, we also have Karel de Marchi Sarvas, who is Executive Director of Health for Animals. So they will talk about the recommendations on the significance of addressing AMR within the agri-food sector. So uh, thank you so much for, for using and sharing this very short time. I'd like to hear from you now, considering these recommendations six and seven, can you please elaborate on the strategies and actions that are necessary to reduce the need and the use of antimicrobials in the agri-food sectors? And in addition to this, why is it crucial to have proper evidence, the data surveillance systems in place, to enable us to gather this information? So please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Malin. Uh, to answer your question, I think it's important to note that the vast majority of antimicrobials produced globally are currently used in the agri-food sector and primarily in intensive livestock production systems. These systems, by their very nature, are a hotbed for disease emergence and transmission and as a result require, almost as a prerequisite, the routine and group prophylactic use of antibiotics, often in sub-therapeutic doses which allow a perfect environment for the emergence of AMR. So as a result, there's now a broad agreement that reducing the amount of antimicrobials used in the agri-food sector is needed. The critical question that the platform's recommendations try to answer is how the needed significant reduction can be achieved. The platform's recommendation promotes two strategies. First is a transformation to agri-food systems that optimize and promote animal health and animal welfare to reduce the need for antimicrobial use. Where this has already been done, the current evidence suggests that such a transformation can be achieved with no meaningful negative impacts for both production cost and productivity levels. And two, closely related to this, the platform recommends that member states consider the urgent phasing out of all use of medically important antimicrobials for growth promotion and routine group prophylactic use in healthy animals in an ambitious stepwise country specific approach in accordance with the relevant BOA and Codex international standards. Now, while the platform's recommendation does not give an indication as to the degree of reduction needed, I should note that the Global Leaders Group on AMR very recently encouraged member states to consider a 30 to 50% overall reduction in antimicrobial use in the agri-food se sector by 2030. And I think that's a level of ambition that complements the platform's recommendations and reflects the bold action needed. And finally, as already highlighted by the UN General Assembly during its high-level meeting on AMR in 2016, strengthened AMR and AMU surveillance is needed as well. Country-specific action on reducing AMU in the agri-food system will rely on the accuracy and completeness of information on how much and how antimicrobials are used. For the agri-food system, the platform strongly recommends that member states commit to sharing information on AMU in animals with the World Organization for Animal Health through their new AniMU system. And finally, in closing, in our agri-food systems, responsible use equals reduced use. An urgent action to promote animal health and animal welfare in the design of agri-food systems will be key to achieving this. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador uh, Grappe, for the introduction. Um, my name is Carl Dumashi Savas. I represent Health for Animals, and we're the Global Animal Health Association. Uh, we participated in, in drafting these recommendations, and we support them. And uh, thanks to those who, who led the process. So three short points for me. I know we're running out of time. Number one, uh, we believe these recommendations are very actionable, uh, and they're realistic because they're based in science and are on widely accepted and endorsed concepts such as the, uh, uh, the, the codes of uh, Codex and WOA and norms and standards. Um, recommendation six emphasizes the importance of surveillance and monitoring um, of both AMR and AMU. Uh, and in my slightly biased opinion, I believe the WOA 
AnimeUse database system is possibly the, the most comprehensive uh, of all the, uh, the, the data collection systems. And we certainly support increased surveillance and monitoring. This is the basis of, of, of good decision making. Um, recommendation seven states that the need to uh, address the drivers that lead to use or misuse of antimicrobials is essential. And in animals, uh, the main driver is the use uh, the, the main driver of use is, is actually diseases that weaken or kill animals. Uh, and the text clearly identifies some, some solutions like preventative healthcare solutions, biosecurity, vaccination, nutrition, increased veterinary care, and so on. I'm gonna end by saying um, that we in the animal health uh, industry are committed to doing what we do best, which is investing and creating new products and services to help serve the health and welfare of all animals. Thank you. Thank you, and sorry for this short time, but we very much appreciate it, keeping it brief. Thanks, Arjan and Carl. Uh, and now I'd like to welcome Dipali Patel, who's the Director of International Policy from the AMR Action Fund. And you will now talk about the recommendations pertaining to the financing aspects which of course are crucial for, for implementing these necessary actions. But if we look at recommendation three um, on sustainable financing, what strategies can countries employ to effectively and adequately leverage funding? And that means international and domestic resources to really address AMR across the sectors. And how can they do that in face of the competing development priorities? Please, Dipali. The floor is yours. Thank you, Malin. Um, so I think we've already heard uh, from a number of speakers now that we have, I think, really built a strong scientific public health and environmental case for addressing AMR. Um, we cannot advance goals without a strong engagement from financiers. We need a strong financial case now. It is financing that transforms evidence to action. Um, there are a number of strategies that member states can take, both at national, regional, and global level, and this could entail, for example, having a clear plan, such as NAPs, um, that hone in on where financing can unlock action. Developing the strong case for financing, what resources do we need, and how can we move the needle? And this will look different in different places um, around the world. We can be smart about deploying resources. Where can there be synergies? Instead of thinking about competing interests, we might think about complementary interests. So other areas of health, the animal and agriculture sector, um, environmental uh, sector as well, where can we actually advance common goals um, through shared financing? How can we use existing financing and parlay that into more impact? Um, how do we make financing sustainable and accessible, such as through the use of budget lines specifically for uh, AMR interventions or earmarks, uh, percentages of health budgets, for example. Better coordination at the global level between member states, as well as better leveraging of public and private financing um, in the AMR response. But most importantly, our probably our biggest impact in financing will be to increase it. Currently, we have many tools. We could use them better. We could use them more appropriately. But we need to in continue to invest further to ensure that we have tools and resources in the future to address AMR. And without a commitment to continuous and sustainable financing for innovation, we will struggle to keep up with bacteria, which we know are constantly evading not only our tools, but also outpacing our knowledge and our expertise. It is the investment in research and capacity building that will be the critical enabler of success for all of the interventions that we have heard so far. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dipali. And I'm so sorry uh, to see that we're running out of time. For those of you who are able, I hope that you will stay with us and listen to the final parts of this program, which I think is maybe one of the most important. That is why we are doing this. Why should we struggle and why do we need to rather increase and mobilize more efforts. Um, so today we have with us um, Professor Jeff Dunn, who is the president of the Union for International Cancer Control. Um, and he will talk about what is really at stake here. Um, so I think, hope that you can stay and, and listen and please 
Professor Dunn, the floor is yours. Th thank you, Marlon, and uh, uh, good evening, everyone, as it is here. I, I talk to you today as the uh, president of the Union for International Cancer Control, but also uh, as a cancer patient myself, undergoing treatment uh, with personal experience of AMR. Uh, from a global health perspective, you know, cancer is a leading cause of death uh, and disease in most countries. And its treatments such as chemotherapy and radiation therapy uh, can compromise the immune system, exposing patients to the dangers of AMR, which may lead to increased mortality, increased morbidity and decrements, significant decrements to quality of life. I mean, already one in five cancer patients are hospitalized because of infection. Infections are already the second leading cause of death in cancer patients after the disease itself. Now, these numbers can only increase uh, unless we act now on AMR. From a personal point of view, um, the infections that I caught and the long-term combinations of, of high dose and powerful medications that I was administered to fight those infections uh, did significantly compromise my general health, um, did negatively impact uh, on my cancer treatment fidelity, and certainly impacted negatively on my rehabilitation. It is true to say uh, that it was a threat, uh, certainly uh, to my survival and to my rehabilitation. Uh, if we don't act now, AMR will undermine global health. Antimicrobial resistance will undermine the gains we've made in modern medicine. It's a threat to us all. I'd like to congratulate the AMR multi-stakeholder partnership platform. Uh, we now have a set of actionable steps, and now is the time to act. And to each and every stakeholder out there, to each and every member state, um, my encouragement personally and from the UICC to embrace these actionable steps for the sake of global health and for the sake of each and every one of us, uh, now is the time to act. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you immensely, Professor Dunn, for sharing your story. And I think this really reminds us that our collective efforts can truly make a difference and save lives. Thank you. So now I'd like to welcome Gatito Lucy who is the Secretary General for the African Youth Antimicrobial Resistance Alliance Task Force. So fantastic that we have one, isn't it? So Lucy, could you please share with us why it's crucial to preserve antimicrobials also for future generations? Please, Lucy. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Lucy, as you've heard. I'm a vet student at the University of Nairobi. Uh, imagine it's 2050 and uh, there is a woman with a sick child and they have gone to the hospital, but the kid cannot be treated for a, for a, a, a common disease because there are no antimicrobials to treat the disease. That child will be from us who are the current generation right now. We will be the guardians in by 2050. And as they are saying that by 2050, there, be, there will be detrimental effects of antimicrobial resistance, but we can change now. We can change that now. I don't think there will be anyone who would like to su suffer through the hopelessness, the fear of having to get a disease, the fear of traveling into a country because of a disease, of getting infected with a disease which there are no antimicrobials to treat. So, uh, the first thing that you can do, it's, it is capacity building. The youth need to be taught training on education on what is AMR, what are the effects of AMR. And through this, they can get the skills and also an attitude towards the curbing antimicrobial resistance. There is also the youth need to be given a chance to participate in summits and also projects. We have, we have the skills. We are, have, we are experts, we know the problems that we are facing, we know how to work through these problems, we have the solutions, but we need to be included. Like the upcoming uh, 
unga high level meeting we need to have a youth in the panel we have a solutions and through that you have come up with the as a task force you have come up with our position paper whereby we can be we can work around and we can also have a a, a chance to ex, to to explain our our statement and also to have to give out the solutions that we need to be recognized and to be engaged we also need to create awareness. Nowadays, the youth are always on their phones. They are always on TikTok. They are, we can we understand one another. And through that, we can create maybe creative ideas, jokes, or something entertaining, attractive, so that the youth can be, it is easier to be assimilated by the youths. And also, we can also create ads. Let the information be consistent. Let the information be out there everywhere or around. It's not just in this meeting that we are talking about AMR. No, we can even create ads whereby we can they can be everywhere just as the bacteria are everywhere. We can also do, we can be involved in the implementation, in the planning, implementation, uh, monitoring and evaluation of all these projects involving AMR. We have a voice and we have uh, the skills. And by that, we'll be securing our future and also we'll be ensuring the sustainability of the actions that are being done right now in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucy, for those reassuring and really inspirational words. Um, we are coming to an end. Thank you all esteemed panelists for your remarkable insights and, and your calls to action. So as we uh, conclude this session now, I'd like to invite Arshni Moodley, who is chair of the platform steering committee to uh, offer the concluding remarks. So please, Arshni, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Esteemed guests, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends. First, allow me to extend my heartfelt thanks to our moderator, Marlene Grapper, for her excellent stewardship today. To our speakers who generously dedicated their time and shared their invaluable insights and to all of you joining us from across the globe. I speak to you not just as the chair of the steering committee of the partnership platform, but as a fellow AMR enthusiast, deeply invested in addressing the impacts of AMR in our communities, our animals, our agriculture and our planet. We are at a pivotal moment and the recommendations you have heard today and the stories shared all echo the same message. AMR poses a formidable challenge of our time, and our mission is clear, strengthening health systems and infrastructure, including sustainable financing for all aspects of our national action plans to ensure universal, equitable, and sustainable access to quality essential antimicrobials, vaccines, diagnostics for animal and, uh, and humans, and to enhance global One Health collaboration. It is with this in mind, I call on each of you who have not already done so to join us on, at the partnership platform. It is a space that serves as a focal point for our efforts, and it is here we share our challenges and solutions, fostering a community that is informed and interconnected by shared goals and ideas. As we look ahead, let us leave today inspired not just to act, but to lead. And I'm pleased to share that the UNGA related resources on the partnerships webpage includes an advocacy kit. These resources have been developed, collected and collated, designed to empower us to raise awareness, engage one another and our communities and to advocate and mobilize resources to drive action. Remember every effort counts, every action matters and every one of us plays a role. Thank you for today. Thank you so much, Oshni. And to conclude, I'd also like to reiterate to both members and prospective new members that we should, of course, let us continue to this endeavor to, to address AMR in the One Health approach. And let's make 2024 a year of accelerated action on AMR. So thank you for being with us today. And please share these recommendations and join the platform if you haven't already. Thank you so much for today.